Okay, so this evening we're going to take a systematic, well, go to the next slide, please. This evening we're going to take a systematic look at Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening. And as you can see on the handout, I've broken this into several phases that represent a generally agreed upon perspective on his awakening. And as you will, I'm not going to go into all the details, but so that people are aware, there are at least a half a dozen different renditions of Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening, depending upon the sutra, depending upon the tale, depending upon other materials. And in some cases, I point out some differences, and in some cases, I don't. But I'm using what is a sort of compilation of, of all of these. Uh, and we can see that the term for Bodhi Day in Japan is Shakyamuni. And it's the commemoration of that day that the historical Buddha uh, reached enlightenment. And many people get confused because they say, well, isn't that Vesic? And Vesic is a day that's in the spring, usually in April. It is a combination of Shakyamuni Buddha's birth, his awakening, and his death. In East Asia, these three events are, are commemorated or observed separately. The birth is separate, the, the death is separate, etc. And so Jodowe is the day of awakening, and uh, South Asia separate, uh, celebrates or observes Vesic. Next. Oh. You know, we we often start with Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, awakening with him sitting under the Bodhi tree. And in a very real way, we really have to start six years earlier. Um, six years earlier, he had left his family and the, and the Shakya clan and his life of luxuries um, in order to seek liberation from samsara, liberation from daily life, essentially. Um, and he went and studied as a shramana. And the shramana movement began several hundred years before Shakyamuni Buddha, in around 600, 6th century BCE. And it's Indian in origin. And they were, the shramana were followed a Vedic religion. However, it rejected Vedic Hindu ritualism and the authority of the Brahmins, the traditional priests of the Hindu religion. And they practiced an aesthetic or strict, strict self-denying lifestyle as a way of pursuing their spiritual liberation. And there were six basic schools. And when you, if, you, if one goes into the schools, I'm by, by no means an authority on Shramana, but from the little I know, that if you look at, at some of the six basic schools, you're going to find that many of the ideas that you see in Buddhism were actually highlighted in these various schools. Now, I said there were, there were depending upon which um, history or hagiography that one reads, there are either two or three teachers that he studied with previous to his leaving and sitting under the Bodhi tree. Um, but when we see things such as um, denial of a creator god, which is a, a major feature of Hinduism, you'll find several of the shamanic schools uh, adhering to that idea. You'll find one school believed in the absolute ag agnosticism. And what I mean by absolute agnosticism, meaning, and, and I think that the Shakyamuni Buddha really got some of his ideas from this school, is that to a very large extent, we don't know. The best that you can say is, I'll wait and see, or, you know, I, I just, I don't know. And so it's really interesting to be in that position of being a religious leader and just saying, that's outside my wheelhouse, so to speak when asked a particular question. Now, for instance, when, when Shakyamuni Buddha was asked about um, uh, 
beginning of the world? He said, I don't know. Go ask an astrologer. That's not what I deal with. You know, as, as one example, that would be a, a sort of a, a, a agnosticism. And another one was a practicing meditation called the sphere of nothingness. And you can see how the meditation called the sphere of nothingness may eventually have led to meditation on, on emptiness or on shunyata. In the end, Shakyamuni Buddha believed that the life of an extreme ascetic was not bringing him any closer to liberation from samsara after, like you say, six years. And so he, he left his, his last teacher. And, and just so that you know, these are referred to as yogic teachers. That doesn't mean that they all practiced yoga that we visualize in America today, since for the most part, that is a very... Um, would be the right, that's a very secularized um, form of those practices. Um, but a yogic practitioner just means someone who is actually practicing. One, one would say that when one does the goma, that's a yogic practice, to give you an idea of what the term yogic actually means. Um, thus, he left his guru in the sangha and set out on his own to find out what had thus eluded him. And it's important to point out from my perspective, that without that six years of searching, it's unlikely that he would have become the Tathagata because it was those six years, even though the meditations may not have been what eventually led him to awakening. Nonetheless, it was a kind of training in spiritual practices, and he brought with him much of that training into what we think of as Buddhism today. Next slide, please. So that was the first phase. The second phase, which here I'm going to refer to as the middle way in compassion, is that he had, Shakyamuni Buddha had crossed a river. And in a sense, I view this almost as a purification. And we see the use of the river continually alluded to in Buddhism. And he crossed the river, he gets to the other side, and the man is just really skin and bones. The previous picture that we saw of the, the statue of him would be what people imagined he looked like, that skin and bones sort of character. Um, here he's got his clothes on, so you can't see what he looks like. Um, <clears throat> and he was approached by Sujata, who was a village girl, a milkmaid, and interestingly enough, seeing him sitting under the tree, sitting under a tree, he imagined, she imagined him to be a tree spirit. And she had been trying to become pregnant to no success. And so she brought with her milk gruel, which was considered a, a, a kind of medicine, uh, brought with her milk gruel to, as an offering, I was going to say, could you give me a hand with that? As an offering to the tree spirit. And so when he had then um, had the, the milk rule, he recognized that he, he, he had already rejected the extreme practices, first leaving his family the practices of luxuries, uh, hedonism in, in its own way, and the total denial of, of sustenance and and shelter, etc. It was the, the life of the Shramana. And so he had already rejected those extremes for the middle way. But here the middle way really takes the 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 role of the young woman who's offering him the milk rule so that he can regain his sustenance. Now what her what her motive was, we can, you know, we we already have spoken about. Um, but that was a compassionate act. And so I see in that the beginning, not only of the middle way, but also of, of compassion. Now, when he had left his, his team, yes, right. I understand why you're just talking about compassion, but how does the middle way label apply to this? I'm not sure I understand. You, you, you mean the, the giving of the, what is the milk rule by the young woman? Why is this the middle way? Because he's having a meal, 
when we're talking about the shamanas, they would eat like one date a day. And that's why they got so skinny. And so the middle way is the middle way between the extreme of self-denial and the luxuries that he had lived in, in, the, in the palace. Okay. Um, and so this was the beginning of his practicing of the middle way in the end compassion. And so with renewed vigor, he found a comfortable seat under the Ficus Religiosa, which is the scientific name of the right, scientific name of the uh, Bodhi tree. And at the time, it would have looked something like this. Now, it's still a really big tree with a really big trunk and fences and all sorts of offerings around it. And, you know, but that's what sort of what it would have looked like at the time. That's a typical, because it, which is a, uh, interesting enough, a sacred fig tree. That's the, that's the term for it. Uh, this species of fig that belongs to the mulberry family, and it's known as the Bodhi tree or the Papala tree in Pali. Uh, the sacred fig is considered to have been a religious of religious significance in the three major Indic religions of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. And as a matter of fact, among the Hindus and Jain ascetics, it's considered the species to be so sacred that they often meditate under it. So it wasn't something that was unique to Shakyamuni Buddha. That was a tree that had long been used for the purposes of meditation. And, and, and it really has a lot to do with the shape of the leaf and the veins of the leaf and things that we don't need to go into unless you want to be a botanist. Um, but that was the third phase. So the first phase was the phase of the six years that he spent with the Shramana, which are wandering mendicants. The second stage was the stage in which he had been re refreshed, renewed by the, the milk rule <laughs> given to him by Sujata. Um, and the third phase is the, the meditation. The fourth phase, next please. is Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. And here's where there's a difference of the recounting of the Great Awakening. And I'm not going to do a comparison of differences. I'll only meld the tale in a way that pr provides us with an insight into the event. One of the accounts tells us that during the meditation, he encounters Mara, both sensual and fearsome. Mara are, are demons. Um, and the demons, to some people, are actual beings that, that attack you. And then there's the, demon, there's the Mara as the metaphor. And these particular Mara are associated with death, rebirth, and desire. And Nina Ponika Tara, who describes Mara as the personification of forces antagonistic to enlightenment. In other words, you know... For all of us who sit in meditation, we all experience Mara. <clears throat> Sometimes the Mara um, are really, they're, they're shapeshifters. Because sometimes the Mara are really pleasant thoughts. We're sitting and we're meditating and we're meditating with purpose. And all of a sudden our mind wanders and we're thinking about what we're going to do tomorrow or what we did yesterday. or That's a Mara. Sometimes the Mara is really gruesome because and, and by the way if one is paranoid schizophrenic i suggest you not do meditation because then the mara is going to look like those terrible beings that you've been speaking to uh, all the time um, so mara is not something that only happens to the, in the case of shakyamana buddha it's something that happened to anyone when they're meditating or even if they're just daydreaming perhaps um, Anyway, so he was a, these specific Mara that are identified um, with Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening specifically had to do with death, sensual pleasures, and um, death, sensual pleasures, and what's the third one? I already told you. Illness. You know, rebirth. It was rebirth. Yeah, rebirth. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Oh. Of course. Of course. <laughs> There's a test. So, <laughs> I feel like I feel like every time. 
So, and I was talking about some people view the, the Mara in metaphysical ways, and then others as a metaphor for the numerous ways our senses of provisional self fights off the surrender of the notion of Atman, or self-existent external self, while we undergo the realization of an-Atman, of non-self. And so, in other words, it's been um, put forth by many scholars that the Mara that were being uh, that were experienced by Shakyamuni Buddha were in fact being brought about as he was trying to drop this notion of Atman, of self, which is an eternal self, to that of an Atman. That, that's some, some scholars will, will discuss that specifically. But in conquering Mara, Siddhartha reached out of his right hand to touch the earth, and the earth itself spoke and said, I bear you witness, and Mara disappeared. To this day, the Buddha is often portrayed in this earth witness posture, with his left hand palm upright in his lap, and his right hand touching the earth. The longer discourse of Sakaka <coughs> is, by Shakyamuni Buddha describes his enlightenment in three, straight, in three stages, and this is a, a Pali uh, revision. During the first watch of the night, the Buddha discovered all his past lives and the cycles of rebirth, realizing that he had been born and reborn countless of times before. This is a recognition of samsara and resultant dukkha. The second watch, the Buddha discovered the law of karma and the importance of living by the Eightfold Path. Now, karma, as we know, means literally just action. It means whatever you do now is going to have consequences. And the Eightfold Path is composed of shila, morality, which is where one starts on the Buddhist path, samadhi, <coughs> meditation, a means of calming the mind and discerning the real, and prajna, wisdom, and this is the ability to understand the three characteristics of all things, which are anika, impermanence, dukkha, dissatisfactoriness, and anatta, non-self. During the third watch, the Buddha discovered the Four Noble Truths, finally reaching Nirvana. And here, I have to say that Nirvana can be interpreted as the extinguishing of the fires that cause rebirths and associating suffering, or being an unconditioned state and the elimination of desire. It's the object of knowledge of the Buddhist path in and of itself. That is how we're defining Nirvana in this case. And so as you can see on the, the uh, handout, in his words, my heart, thus knowing, thus seeing, was released from the fermentation of sensuality, released from the fermentation of becoming, released from the fermentation of ignorance, and with release there was the knowledge, released. I discerned that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done, there is nothing further in this world. And henceforth, Gautama was known to his followers as the Buddha or Awakened One, now referred to as Shakyamuni Buddha or the Awakened One of the Shakya clan, to distinguish him from all the other Buddhas. And I, I just want to add very briefly on this, that that quote, my heart thus knowing, thus seeing, was released from the fermentation of sensuality, etc., Fermentation is referring to, when you stop and think about fermentation, it's really the development of something over time. It's, it's just like the fermentation of wine. You add sugar, it feeds the, it feeds the uh, molecules, and um, the wine then changes its characteristic. And so that, that's what fermentation means in this case. Next, please. <coughs> What are some of the ramifications of his awakening? Well, aside from the amazing achievement we associate with Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening, is the teaching that he provided following his realization of the nature of reality. And according to the story, oh, wait a second. yeah, so according to the story, immediately after his awakening, the Buddha was hesitant as to whether or not he should teach the Dharma to others. 
it's also reported that he attempted to teach on numerous occasions, but was sort of tongue-tied and nobody really, or at the very least, nobody really understood what he was talking about, whether it was tongue-tied or not is a, a different issue, I suppose. And so he was concerned that people were so, so overpowered by delusion, greed, and anger that they could never embrace the path. So his attitude was, why bother? Um, however, the heavenly Brahmin, Sahapati, convinced him, arguing that at least some people would understand it, and the Buddha relented and agreed to teach. And so he went forth. And here, I want to look at uh, Chigi's fourfold teachings. Um, and the first discourses were the Avatapsaka Sutra. And keep in mind, I don't know if anyone has, has read the Avatapsaka Sutra, but it's really rather dense and it's long. But aside from that, because many of the sutras are rather dense and long, but aside from that, it reports one of the main teachings in that is the teaching of inner penetration. And when you put yourself back to the time of Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago, that teaching would have been one of the things that was really outstanding, that was not considered to be um, sort of standard philosophical understanding. And when we think of, of, of the Four Noble Truths, for instance, the first two were not necessarily unique to Buddhism. You'll find the idea that, that, that life contains suffering or dukkha, the idea that dukkha is caused by uh, attachment, which is then due to desire, anger, and, and um, uh, spiritual ignorance or delusion. Those we find in other uh, Indic teachings. What was really unique were the final two, that, that there is a way out of the suffering and that that way out of the suffering is the Eightfold Noble Path. And so the basics of the foundational Buddhist teachings are sometimes the most difficult. Do people really understand the import of the Four Noble Truths? I bet most people that are present for this could tell me what they are. But do you really understand what they are? Those are two different things. We can int intellectually understand something, but it's much different to understand it in a way that makes a difference in our lives. And so that's what he was concerned with. And when you get to the notion of the Avatamsaka Sutra on um, inner penetration, um, the inner penetration is difficult. It, assumes that the universe is an inter infinite network of entities that acquire their particular existences through each other. In other words, interpenetration is that there is nothing in this world which is unique to the individual that they haven't gotten from someplace else. It, to me, this goes back to the very, very, uh, Basic, the 12 Nidaya, the dependent origination, for instance, the idea of inner penetration really goes back, goes back to that. That somehow we all like to think that I'm special. And we don't see the connectedness between others. And I sometimes, I, I look out and I look at the, well, especially the, the world we live in today, which seems to be polarized in so many ways. Um, and I wonder if, the notion of inner penetration, if people could really grasp that notion, we would sort of do away with that polarization. If people could grasp the notion of inner penetration in a very real way, we would not be trying to salvage the environment. If people could understand inner penetration, would we really be having a problem with our political parties? No, because we would understand that everybody needs everybody else and everything else, not just everybody, let's not make it species specific here, everything else. You know, it, it, if, if we think about um, the, the smallest little critter that we can imagine, some insects, and, and many of us are, are oblivious to the notion that without some of those insects, life would not exist on this world. 
we look at them as a as a as a challenge. The mosquitoes that buzz around our heads that we swat, you know, and while we're trying to eat our hot dog. But at the same time, we have to recognize that the web of life is the way it is because of interpenetration, and that's the nature of the universe. And it's a universal law. It's not specific to the earth. It's not specific to our species, et cetera, et cetera. It's universal. Yes. Yeah. What's the relationship between Indra's net and interpenetration? Indra's net is the way that interpenetration is explained in in the Avatam right. Sutra. Um, so uh, finally. We see that there's in Chigi's fourfold teachings, and I use this because what are the ramifications as of awakening? First ramification was the first discourses, which the Avatar Sakya Sutra, which, according to uh, many, nobody could really understand. So that he went on to the second teaching, which is the Triptaka, which we think of as the Pali Canon today, the three, the, the Pali Sutras, the Abhidharma, and the Vinaya. And then the third is the shared teachings of the Nikaya and the Mahayana. The fourth is the Prajna Paramita discourses like the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, and finally the Lotus Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra. And one of the things I want to point out here is that today we're observing his awakening. That's, that's important on a number of levels. But we have to realize that he died and we, we observe his death uh, later on next year and but in many ways he the, the physical Shakyamuni Buddha passed away and then subsequently he was chopped into tiny pieces and put into stupas all around Asia <laughs> so you could go find pieces of them if these are off his um, um, cremated remains were chopped up and brought all over the place so he's no longer around but in a very real way, the Shakyamuni Buddha still exists because we adhere to his teachings and his writings. And, and it's, it's a kind of rebirth in a different fashion, if you will, because every time we pick up a sutra, he's reborn because we're hearing his words. You know? Um, next, please. As if his actions are still acting? As yes. If, as if his, 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 his karma is his still karma going. His karma is still there because his actions look, are, look are what still, they yeah, are still There are literally, literally billions of people in the world who follow his teachings. If that's not karma, what is? Right. And Because I, I, I think of MLK, I think of right. Einstein in that same, well, know, and, like and, that, and, they're, they're, and, and they're to continuing. Sure, when, you, when you think of MLK, who is a magnificent person, he writes about interpenetration, mm -hmm. you know, or he spoke about interpenetration. Mm -hmm. So how is Bodhi Day observed? Remember, in North America, Bodhi Day will be tomorrow. Bodhi Day uh, is commemorated in, in Asia, mm -hmm. and it can be, can be commemorated this way anywhere by doing additional meditations. The Zen schools practice Rohatsu, which is a period of about a week to 10 days of observation of Shakyamuni Buddha's um, awakening in which they sit meditation in um, sequentially more time each day for about, for about a week. Study of the Dharma, picking up a sutra and reading it or picking up a commentary to that sutra and reading it. Chanting of a Buddhist sutra, and I would, I would suggest, by the way, if you're going to study the, a sutra, chant part of that sutra as part of that process. At the very least, being cognizant of compassion toward all sentient beings. It's a day to really pay a, a bit more attention to how you are compassionate or not, whatever the case may be. Next, please. How do you choose to observe Bodhi Day? Mm -hmm. And I think we have here a very contented Bodhi Kitty. 
<laughs> as opposed to bodhicitta. <laughs> yes. So we're going to go to um, questions and answers, and we'll stop the we'll stop the recording at this time.